welcome back to another episode of Tell Me Darling. I'm Jess. And I'm Phil. And we're your hosts. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm delirious. I spent nine hours today writing our script for this week's episode because we've got a busy week and we had a busy weekend and today was the only day I had to do it. And I was like, I can't not write mm. a script this week. So I just sat down at 9am thinking I'd be done by lunchtime. I was not. I was done at 6.30 p.m. So I just want you to know that as you're listening that I worked hard this week to get this episode out. <laughs> today. And now, today, I worked yeah. hard today um, and it's now 8 o'clock at night and we're going to record this. It's going to take us about an hour. Then Phil's going to have to get stuck into editing. because Which will I, take me probably two, three hours. That's still not as long as what it took me to write. And then, yeah. <laughs> you get to sleep after we finish. I don't. No, i got to pack my bag. Look, i got a busy week this week, guys. i got to pack my bag. I'm going to the Gold Coast tomorrow because I have this like business conference, which is exciting. But I did just have a fit in the bedroom trying to pack my bags. I didn't succeed. I didn't pack a thing because I have a wardrobe full of clothes and nothing to wear. Explain that to me. Explain how that is a thing. I can easily. I know that. I, I know that everyone that's listening mm-hmm. is nodding their hair head in the car right now. So they're like, every, relate. every male that's listening is saying you've got plenty of clothes. I don't. Babe, Everything. I will go in there and pack your wardrobe for the next couple of days. Easy. Yeah, but doesn't mean it will look good. <sighs> I just I can't figure it out. I've tried on clothes and I look like I'm going to fucking work. That's fine. It's a work event. It's yeah, but it's not. I don't think it's like that. You know, I think, I, o- have, I think you're overthinking. I it. am overthinking it. Look, I'm having a rough week, guys. I'm having a rough week. I don't know if anyone else can relate to this. Probably not Phil because look at him. He's very handsome. I All feel, the time. I feel, <laughs> <laughs> I feel really ugly this week. I keep saying it to Phil. I don't feel good. I'm avoiding mirrors and it's not a great week for me mentally. So let's mm. put that out there on our true crime podcast, Relatable. Um, <laughs> what, what do I keep telling you? Nothing. What do you mean? Don't say nothing. I What'd mean, you say? I Avoid keep, mirrors, babe. I did not. <laughs> don't you dare. I'd never said that. I tell. I keep telling you all the time, you don't need to worry about it, honey. You're beautiful. It's all mm-hmm. right. Okay. But anyway, carry on. That's what I'm battling this week. Even now, I'm like, can we just not put the video on? Anyway, moving on. I'll keep the video on me the whole time. Yeah, it'll that'll be, that'll be an easy edit. Yeah, don't put me in it. Honestly, all right, easy. I, I will can... honestly do that. That's so mean. It, well, you said you didn't. You feel ugly, so you don't want to be on camera. Mm-hmm. It's fine, honey. You're beautiful inside and out. Who you are? <laughs> oh God, I could cry. All right, let's <laughs> let's talk about something positive. What have you got? Um, I got a lot actually. Big weekend, big mm-hmm. week going on. Um, where do I start? So I started with Father's Day. We decided to go away for the night. <laughs> yes, we did. And How was that? It was really good. We went to River Fire, watched the fireworks. Um, had some nice dinner mm-hmm. <laughs> late at night. Yeah, but it was good. Um, kids loved it. And that was really good. And then Father's Day, I um, Father's Day was really cool. Hey, uh-huh. really special. Yeah, we were at the hotel and kids give me all their presents mm-hmm. and I get one present, get two present, and then I get these little books that they gave me. Mm-hmm. And it was a book from each of the kids, and inside the book, I had like the first page was like. A letter to me and then when i started reading i just broke down in tears he did he was crying <laughs> i was crying <laughs> I was crying was so hard lots of tears i was like uh, yes yes yeah, you got me there i got him it was just a real happy cry yeah it made me think how lucky i am and how much i love the kids yeah it was really cool yeah it yeah. was really nice yeah and then i got a massage gun that was awesome mm-hmm. Been getting massages um and then this week um i've started back not that I ever left, but started back like properly on my fitness journey. You have. Um, it was always there, but I just wasn't watching what I was eating. I was just I, being a big hungry bull week. I feel like that. whatever. Yeah, that's me um, lately. But yeah, today was day one. It was good. Got up at the gym, uh, 4.30, did my meal prep, trained again just now, went for a run around the block. Mm-hmm, you did. I've only had water and coffee today, so. Proud of you. Good, good job. Watch out, babe. I'm going to be shredded in no, no just, time. Just just what I need when I'm feeling <laughs> so good. Just what I need. And I'm feeling good. I need to get back into something. This isn't working for me. <laughs> Maybe. Oh, gosh. Yeah. All right. Well, last week I asked you guys 
or I put up a question box on mm-hmm. my stories to get our listeners to engage. I wanted to share some stories from them and whatnot, just whatever. And we got one reply. That was my fault because I put the question box up like 10 minutes before we were about to film. I yeah. need to give it more time. And this week I gave it a day, which is good. So we got some replies this time. Oh, cool. But I also asked you guys what we should call this segment because I don't really know what to call it. Like it needs a name. It's you know? just the intro, isn't it? No, like this part where we go, because I want to do this every week. I want to put up a question box and I want people to either tell me a good news or like a shout out that they want to give to someone that listens or just something like a story, something crazy happened to them. Mm. I want to know. So I need like a segment for this part. Anyway, we got some suggestions. So I'm going to throw them at you and I want to hear what you think about that. The truth. Do I get to do this one? Like this was like. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah, you can do that. So we got listen, darling. Oh yeah. Okay, <laughs> he's not sold on that one. The darling dirt. The darling dirt. Oh, don't mind it, but dirt sounds like like a negative type of. I don't like that. Okay. I do like it, but I don't like it. All right, we'll move on. Sorry, whoever said that. <laughs> um, I don't not like it. A little update from our darlings. I, I like that. That's cool. Okay. A little update, yeah. Podcast foreplay. Oh, <laughs> shit. You know, I like that one. <laughs> <laughs> you no, I knew you would. Um, <laughs> JP catch ups. Oh, yeah. Jess and Phil catch ups. JP, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, Jess and Phil's weekly spiel. Yeah, but yeah. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Uh, we had Tell Me Guys. Yeah. Well, I feel like you guys are just being a bit lazy now. You're just taking our name and making a <laughs> twist to it. <laughs> um, one that we got. Okay, this is one that I like. This is okay. my favorite. Darling Diaries. Yeah, that's good. I didn't mind that one. That's good. Yeah. It's where darlings. Um, yeah. We had Tell Us Darlings. We had Listener Tells. Thrill Me Phil. Oh, <laughs> you know that's what I do. <laughs> um, tell Us Darlings. Share With Me Darling. Darlings, tell me. Just lots of like, tell me, darling kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think my favorite out of those was the Darlings Diaries, but I'm not 100% sold. So, I yeah. feel like now I'll that have... you've heard me say it, mm-hmm. you guys probably have a better idea of what I'm chasing, like a segment title, you know? Mm-hmm. So, we need more more suggestions. We mm-hmm. need it. We need more. Yep. You know? I feel you. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So I'll save it for this week. Mm-hmm. Won't won't pick one yet. Wasn't sold. But if you come out with something else, let's let's go. I'll also I'll I'll put up a hundred dollar bloom voucher for whoever names our segment. If I pick it, you get a hundred dollar voucher That's for Bloom. Nice. It is nice. nice. Thanks. Okay. So <laughs> um what else did I want to share? I should have had it ready. But we did get a little DM last week as well, a little review of the week, yeah. which I did send to you. So yes. you've already read it, but I'm going to get you to read it out because mm-hmm. I thought it was really cute. Yeah, it was cool. Go on, Phil. Hey, guys. I love the podcast. I'm a male listening to it thanks to my partner showing me. You guys are awesome. My partner has been following you, Jess, Ooh. Uh, for years. She loves you. Mm. Every Wednesday morning, we listen to the new podcast on our ways to work. Then we talk about it at night when we get home. So, shout out to Chris and Shanice. hope mm-hmm. I'm saying that right. Probably. C and C, double C. <laughs> it's <a> Canadian club. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks guys. That How was really good. cool. That was so cute. Was cool. Thank you guys. That was so nice. I loved that one. I thought it was really nice. So, shout out to them yeah. for listening. Thank I think you. it's cute that they drive to work separately, yeah, listen, listen and then come time. back and talk about mm. it. How nice is that? That is cool. Yes. Um, we also got one from Brooke that says, I hang out for your podcast every week. Love the stories, but also love the banter. So thanks, Brooke. Yeah. Appreciate that. Um, but yeah, so today's episode, you're in for a long one. I worked hard today. I knew it was going to be long, but I didn't make it a two-parter just for you guys. But it is going to be a bit of a long one. So strap in. Are you ready to hear it? Hooray. <laughs> Come on. Tell me, darling. You might not like it, but they like it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. Tell me, darling. Han and Bika Pan were refugees who had fled Vietnam during the Vietnam War in the late 1970s and settled into Canada. A few years later, they would go on to welcome their first daughter, Jennifer, into the world on June 17th, 1986. 
Three years later, in November 1989, the, then, uh, the family then welcomed little Felix. Like many immigrant families, the parents aspired to provide a better life for their children and their new homeland. Even while in the midst of parenting, Han and Bika were no strangers to hard work. They landed jobs at Magna International, an auto parts manufacturer in Aurora. Han became a skilled tool and dye maker, while Bika put her expertise to use in crafting car parts. Their dedication extended to their everyday lives also. Living within their means and saving diligently, Han and Bika's efforts paid off by 2004. With their unwavering commitment, they managed to buy a lovely home in the peaceful neighborhood of Markham. This new place even had a spacious two-car garage, a symbol of their dreams coming true. Han was behind the wheel of a stylish Mercedes-Benz, while Bika gracefully glided through the streets in her Lexus ES300. Their hard work and smart money management had not only provided them with these great cars, but also a healthy $200,000 nest egg safely tucked away in the bank. Their journey from humble beginnings to financial security showcased their determination and the opportunities they embraced in their new life in Canada. Good on them. Yeah. That's cool. As the children got older and the parents worked hard to raise them. Children? It, how many do they have? I thought they had one. Two, Jennifer and Felix. Oh, sorry. I, Felix I, was born three years after Jennifer. I don't you know zoned out. I, I don't know where I was. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you zoned out. As the children got older and the parents worked hard to raise them, it became evident that the parents held strong traditional family values and they placed a strong emphasis on education and academic success. They believed that a good education would lead them to a prosperous future for their children. As a result, they had high expectations for Jennifer and her brother Felix regarding their academic achievements and future careers. Mm -hmm. From an early age, Jennifer was raised with high hopes for success. Jennifer was involved in various extracurricular activities during her childhood, including piano lessons, which she began at the age of four, and figure skating. These activities were part of her parents' efforts to provide her with a well-rounded education and opportunities for personal development. During this time, Jennifer's family maintained strong ties to their Vietnamese culture heritage. This included celebrating cultural festivals, participating in community events, and maintaining connections with their local Vietnamese community in the greater Toronto area. Jennifer was described as diligent as a diligent student during her early school years. She worked hard to meet her parents' expectations and achieved good grades in school. So, as you can see, Jennifer's parents were definitely on the stricter side when it came to parenting. And I would say this was definitely a contribution between their culture, but also their desire for their children to have an, every opportunity in life that they never had. Mm. I mean, they fled a war and all they want for their children is to have a better life than they did. And I think regardless of your parenting style, that that's something that we can all relate to as parents in some way. We all just want the best for our children. Yes. But as Jennifer grew older, she began to see her parents' way of parenting less about wanting the best for her and more about having control over her, labeling them as tiger parents. Have you ever heard of that? Rawr. What? No. Don't ever do that again. No, I haven't heard of tiger parents. Uh, so a tiger parent is a term often used to describe a strict and demanding parenting style, typically associated with Asian cultures. But thus, Jennifer still wanted to make her parents proud and she wanted to be able to achieve all of the things that they wanted for her in life. But she also wanted to be a kid and do what other girls her age were doing, like play or go to parties or mm. even date. By the time Jennifer was in elementary school, she'd filled a trophy case full of awards. That's she, high school, yeah? Middle school. Middle school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She had a love for figure skating and she hoped to compete at the national level with her sights set on the 2010 Winter Olympics in Vancouver. But sadly, she tore a ligament in her knee and she was unable oh. to compete professionally anymore. But Jennifer still continued as she loved ice skating. Some nights during elementary school, Jennifer would come home from skating practice at 10 p.m. She'd do homework until midnight and then she'd go to bed. At Mary Ward Catholic College, Jennifer worked hard to keep her parents pleased. She only ever wanted to make them proud. As Jennifer's graduation from grade 8 drew near, she held high hopes of being named valedictorian and proudly collecting a cluster of medals to celebrate her academic accomplishments. 
However, when the moment arrived, her expectations crumbled. To her astonishment, she didn't receive a single medal and the title of valedictorian eluded her grasp. It was a shocking blow that left her reeling. The disappointment weighed heavily on her young shoulders. She questioned the purpose of putting in so much effort if no one acknowledged her hard work and dedication. Yet, instead of allowing her devastation to show, Jennifer adopted a coping mechanism that she would later refer to as her happy mask. In the face of adversity, she chose to conceal her inner turmoil and put on a facade of contentment, telling anyone who inquired that she was perfectly fine. As time went on, Jennifer's grades began to slip. The A's on report cards she was so used to receiving turned to B's and she, even though most people would consider B's a great mark and most parents, this wasn't the case for Jennifer's parents. Anything other than an A wasn't good enough. Han and Bikha's plans for Jenna was that she would one day become a doctor and so she needed perfect grades. Jennifer feared her parents finding out that her grades had slipped and so to maintain the illusion of success, Jennifer began to fabricate her academic achievements and began for forging her report cards and transcripts. This was just the beginning of a dark path of deception that Jennifer would go down. Jennifer continued to apply herself to her education. With her parents closely monitoring, she was allowed to continue her extracurricular activities like music and ice skating, as long as she also studied the theory aspect and kept up her grades. And even as she grew older, she was still not allowed to have sleepovers. She wasn't allowed to go to parties or date. However, Jennifer was allowed to go on a school trip to Europe towards the end of high school in 2003. It was this trip that Jennifer and her friend Daniel Wong grew a romantic connection. That summer, they started secretly dating. Jennifer could never tell her parents about Daniel as they would never allow her to continue to see him. Daniel was also a son of immigrants. He had a Filipino and a Chinese background and he and Jennifer had met in band practice at school. During the last year of high school, Daniel's parents transferred transferred him to an art school in a nearby district, leaving Jennifer alone at St. Mary's. Daniel's grades had begun slipping also, and he had started to get himself into trouble. And so his parents were trying to reignite his spark for learning and really just wanted to get him back on a straight path. But unfortunately, even with their efforts, Daniel continued down a dark path. By the end of school, he had been charged with dealing cannabis after half half a pound of it had been found in his car. Despite this, Jennifer was still smitten with Daniel. She never involved herself in Daniel's drug dealing and he also kept it away from her. And the two really grew a strong attraction for each other. Although Jennifer tried her best to keep Daniel a secret, her parents eventually found out and immediately put an end to the relationship. At least that's what they thought. Jennifer continued to sneak behind her parents' back and see Daniel, which honestly I don't think is that uncommon. I think a lot of girls probably hid their first boyfriends from their parents and Jennifer obviously did it out of fear. Her parents were extremely strict and she wasn't even allowed to hang out with friends outside of school. Her focus had to be on her academic goals 100% of the time and so I don't find it that strange that she chose to go behind her parents back and continue to see Daniel like we were all teenagers once. Mm -hmm. In 2004 Jennifer who was now 18 was still sneaking behind her parents back to see Daniel. She tried hard in school and eventually that paid off when she was accepted into Ryerson University on an early admission. Although it wasn't Toronto University like she had originally hoped she knew that eventually she could study there if she committed to studying science at Ryerson for two years and then she could transfer to pharmacology at Toronto. Han and Bikar were thrilled that Jennifer had been accepted on a scholarship. Although Han's original dream for Jennifer was to be a doctor, he moved on to the idea that a pharmacist would probably be a better fit for Jennifer and he supported her new journey. They supported her financially during this time. They also drove her to and from classes. Eventually, they even allowed her to spend a couple of nights a week at a fellow classmate's house to make the commute easier and she wouldn't be so exhausted. During this time, Jennifer's parents would discover that she was still seeing Daniel and again they told Jennifer to end it immediately. Jennifer understood where her parents were coming from and that they just wanted the best for her, so she told them that she had cut all ties with Daniel and was focusing on her studies. 
Jennifer managed to get a work placement at a hospital for sick children in Toronto. Her parents were over the moon at this information and really thought that all of their hard work and dedication to their children was paying off. Jennifer was enrolled in a great university studying science as well as working at a hospital and actively working towards her goals. And her brother Felix, who was also enrolled in university, was studying mechanical engineering. Everything the Pan family had been working towards was finally coming into fruition. That is until six years later on November 8th, 2010, when a call is made to 911. Damn, babe. There was a lot of information you just gave me, and I'm trying. I was trying to get in, but you didn't. <laughs> let, you let me get shit in. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and you didn't stutter once. So well I done. I didn't. Thank you. I did a couple um, of times. All right, cool. We're caught up. I don't need to repeat anything mm-hmm. and ask any questions. So it's 2010. 911. Just get into it. Yep. Okay. Where are you, ma'am? was the daughter yeah that was jennifer and then background was that the dad screaming mm-hmm. wow thoughts um uh, well, i have a feeling that on and off those five six years that she was still seeing the boyfriend okay um and the boyfriend obviously knows that the parents don't approve of it mm-hmm. and he's he's mad he's come over to finish the parents so mm-hmm they can live happily ever after. Okay. But then she's not going to want to be with him if she just killed her parents. Yeah. Wild. Okay. So that's your, that's your take. Yeah. And I will continue. Mm-hmm. So November 8th, 2010. Ooh. Sorry. <laughs> what it's was my that? Birthday. It's, it was close to my birthday. No, it's not. Yeah. Okay. November 8th, 2010 started like any ordinary day. A 25-year-old Jennifer went to school while her 53-year-old mother, Bika visited Jennifer's grandfather and ran errands. Felix, now 22, was away at school and Han, now 57, went to work as usual. Jennifer returned home in the afternoon, spending her time practicing the piano and studying for an upcoming test. Her mother returned home a little after 3 p.m. On this particular day, Han had arrived home a bit later than usual from work. He had forgotten to lock a toolbox on the way home and had to return halfway. Back to work to lock mm-hmm. the toolbox. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He made it home just after 4.30 p.m. He even called his brother, Jennifer's uncle, to see if he wanted to go shopping and they headed to Home Depot. Bika prepared dinner and ate with Jennifer before heading out to her weekly line dancing class, a routine she followed every Monday. She left Han's dinner aside for when he returned from shopping, which he did around 6.15 p.m. Han dined alone and later retired to the study upstairs next to his and his and Bikar's bedroom. He logged onto his computer to catch up on the latest Vietnamese news before bedtime, a routine which he followed because of his early work schedule, which required him to be up at 5 a.m. Mm-hmm. Around 6.30 p.m., Jennifer's friend Adrian paid her a visit. They often had TV nights together and Adrian had bought over the latest episodes of Gossip Girl and How I Met Your Mother from them t- for them to watch. They enjoyed the evening together in the basement, in which... Uh, they had a TV room set up mm-hmm. and Adrian left around 9 p.m. Jennifer then went upstairs to her bedroom, turned on the TV and watched The Amazing Race. At about 9.15 p.m., she heard her mother return from line dancing. So Jennifer briefly went back downstairs and spoke to her mum, who was now watching TV. Then Jennifer returned to her room and continued watching TV herself and called her friend and former co-worker Edward on the phone. Approximately 20 minutes later, Jennifer heard commotion downstairs, including voices and loud footsteps. 
she, I just looked at you and you're looking so intently at me. Yeah. You caught me <laughs> off guard. She heard her mother call out to her father by his name, which was unusual as they typically spoke in Vietnamese at home. Mm -hmm. She heard her mother call his name again, this time with more urgency in her voice. Jennifer suddenly realized that there were people in the house. She heard loud footsteps rushing up the stairs. Terrified and frozen, Jennifer hung up the phone on Edward and stood still. She was too scared to move. Her door was closed and the TV was still on, so she lowered the volume on her TV. She then heard a mix of shouting voices and her dad yelling. Her dad had been asleep but was awakened by the commotion to find a man wearing a baseball cap standing over him. Without his glasses on, he couldn't see properly. The man in the cap shouted at Han, "'Where is the money?' Before Han could react, he was dragged down the stairs to where a terrified Bika was waiting, accompanied by another man. Bika was crying and cowering, wearing her silky green Winnie the Pooh pyjamas. The room was dark, with only the light source coming from the TV that Bika was watching. Bika cried out to her husband and asked how did they get in. Han told her that he didn't know because he was sleeping. One of the men told them to be quiet, you're saying too much. Upstairs, Jennifer summoned the courage to open her door slightly, catching the attention of another man with dreadlocks. He approached her, carrying some string, and tied her hands behind her back. He warned her that he had a gun, and he instructed her to cooperate to make sure that no one got hurt. He then demanded to know where the money was. Jennifer gave him $2,000 cash that she had saved. The man dragged Jennifer to her parents' room, where he demanded that she show him where the rest of the money was hidden. Jennifer claimed to not know, but the man ransacked the room, eventually finding some cash in Bikar's bedside table. They, he then forced Jennifer to kneel at the bottom of the stairs, where she could hear her parents pleading for her safety. Jennifer realised that there were three attackers. The man with Jennifer's parents was yelling at Jennifer's mum, who kept trying to stand up. Confused and not fluent in English, Bikar couldn't understand what the attacker was saying to her. Mm -hmm. So Jennifer yelled out and told her mum to sit still as she didn't want her mum to get hurt. Yeah. The man kept yelling at them, demanding, where is the money? Han mentioned that he had $60 in his pants upstairs, but emphasised that his possessions were valuable, like they had other stuff that they could give them. Mm -hmm. One of the men then dragged Jennifer back up the stairs towards her parents' bedroom. Jennifer remembered that her mother had more money and told the man where it was in the bedroom, approximately $1,100. Jennifer hoped that this would be enough money for the men to let her and her family go, but the men had other intentions. They tied Jennifer to the banister at the top of the stairs and one of the men began searching the kitchen looking for Bikar's purse. I need the money, he said again and hit Han across the back of the head. Han fell to the ground and then the men grabbed Han and Bika and forced them down the basement stairs. Bika was hysterically crying and pleaded with the men saying, you can hurt us but please don't hurt our daughter. Jennifer screamed out from upstairs asking the men to let her go with her parents. Han was silent realizing that this wasn't just going to be a break in. Mm -hmm. Han and Bika were forced onto the sofa and one of the gunmen threw blankets over their heads and without warning the attackers shot Han twice, once in the face and again in the shoulder. They then fired three shots into Bika, hitting her in the neck, shoulder and skull. Silence fell over the room. From the top of the stairs, Jennifer heard the shots and sat there, crying and terrified. She heard one of the men shout, We've got to go now, it's been too long. Jennifer then remembered her phone, which she had tucked into the waistband of her yoga pants when she heard the voices. She manoeuvred the string as much as she could and managed to pull her phone out and call 911. Whoa. A lot, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thoughts? Um, I don't know. Three attackers, obviously... They must know of them if they know that they have the money. Earlier you mentioned that when they were younger, when they bought their house, they had 200000 saved or something yeah. like that. Yeah, that's possible. So, I don't know if it's, yeah. that's got to do with it. Mm -hmm. But, um, yeah, that's just hectic to fully break in and kill her parents. Yeah. Crazy. That's sad. Yeah. So, do you want me to keep going? Yeah. Okay. No, that's it. That's it. <laughs> that's it. The end. Han, who had been shot, was not killed. Oh, he yeah. regained consciousness, uh -huh. covered in blood and unable to see without his glasses. He managed to crawl his way up the basement stairs, groaning in pain. Were the offenders or attackers still in the house? No, okay. they'd left. Yep. 
Jennifer could hear her father's cries and she called out to him, but he ran out the front door seeking help, which is what we can hear on the phone. Oh, he She's yelling at, he's door. calling yeah. help, he's yeah. help, help, in pain. Outside, a neighbor who was about to leave for work encountered a shocking sight. A blood-soaked hand collapsed outside. In the distance, police sirens herald their arrival. Peter was with Han when they arrived. Peter is the neighbor. neighbor. Yep. Constable Mike Tesco and his partner Brian Derrick were two of the first officers on the scene. They approached Han, who was covered in blood, and saw a trail of blood leading into the house from where he had fallen. Han was in pain and visibly upset, but managed to tell them that his wife was inside and she had been shot and his daughter was still inside. More officers began to arrive on scene, one Mm -hmm. of those being Constable Mason Baines. The officers had no idea where the gunmen were, so they went inside to check all of the rooms and clear the house. With guns drawn, they approached the house. They first went to the basement where they discovered the body of Bika Pan. Then Baines made his way up the stairs to where Jennifer was. After checking the other rooms, he made his way back to Jennifer. She was sitting on her knees with her hands bound behind her with a long shoelace. Mm -hmm. He needed scissors to untie her. Upon inspection, she didn't appear to have any bruises or marks. She was unharmed. Derek helped Jennifer up. He wrapped his jacket around her and assisted her outside. When Jennifer came out of the house, she could see her father with the paramedics. She called out to him before getting into an ambulance herself. She asked Derek where her mother was and he gave her the terrible news that she had not survived the attack and that she was dead. Fuck. Yeah. Han was transferred to the hospital where doctors placed him in an induced coma to try and stabilize his condition. Being the only witness to the events of the evening, Jennifer was taken to the station where she was interviewed by the York Regional Police. During the interview, she shared her recollection of events. She explained that two men had entered the house, taken money from her. Oh, sorry. Three men had entered the house, taken money from her, tied her to the banister, and then proceeded to take her parents down to the basement. And then she heard loud pops. So the police make Jennifer go over her statement several times. This is normal because sometimes if like after a trauma, people forget things and they don't remember them the first time. Mm -hmm. It's well after midnight now and she's voluntarily giving her statement a few times. Police ask her to recount her whereabouts for the day as well as her mother and her father to best to the best of her ability. By this time, Felix had received the devastating news about the attack on his family and he too was being interviewed, but he really didn't have anything to contribute because he was on campus at university Mm -hmm. and it's about 30 minutes away. Can you imagine receiving that phone call? I couldn't. Really the worst thing ever. Yeah, it would be insane. When Jennifer hears that Felix is being interviewed next door, she seems concerned, but please tell her it's all a part of the process. The same as how she's being interviewed now. He then tells her that the people that they really need to interview are the people who were last with her mum and her father before they came home. They put the theory to Jennifer that potentially someone may have spotted Bika while she was out line dancing and seen that she was in a luxury car and potentially followed her home, assuming she was a wealthy old woman, which was an easy target. Mm. They then asked Jennifer if they can have access to her phone records. Jennifer had received calls right before the incident and during the incident and she was on her phone right up until the attack. And so the police wanted to use her records so that they could create an exact timeline of events that evening. Is that what they're doing or are they trying to be... Yeah, because she was on the phone yep. when they came and mm-hmm. she they just they're trying to work out an exact timeline. Okay. So Jennifer agrees to sign the consent form, but not without questions. She asked police how far back will they look into her phone? Like how thorough will they search her phone? Mm -hmm. Which to me again is a fair question. I mean, if a police came to me and asked if they could go through my phone, like I would be so scared, Mm -hmm. like just because I would be. But also everyone has a Google history and like some of them are embarrassing. So I would be like kind of weirded out as well. Police tell her that they're basically just time stamping her calls with a heavy focus on that evening, but they are requesting nine days of calls. They tell her that the reasoning is that they may come back to her and be like, okay, we want to interview this person. And she says, if she says like, I don't know where they live or whatever, Mm -hmm. they can go through the records and whoever she called, like it'll be linked to their phone account. They'll have the address and it just makes their like interrogation process easier. Um. I'm going to play a little snippet from that conversation. You to fill out this portion for me. So owner, subscriber, it's the same person. 
as this. So it's you and you, your address, the telephone number, and um, and today's date, and then your signature. And what it is is before we go into it, it's all this is all being recorded again. So it's just that you consent to giving us the records for cell phone number six four seven nine six five two one one eight. Um, you consent to allow the York Regional Police to access the phone records, the said cellular phone company authorized Rogers for the following billing records, incoming and outcoming numbers dialed, registered owner information, including credit and payment history. This is really how we link phones to people, how we confirm it's your phone and the tower site location, if requested for the above mentioned times and dates, the towers now become uh, I just drop that. Towers become relevant in this case because of where you are when the phone call comes in on the, on today's date, right? Is that it firms your story to saying that I was in my room when I made that when the calls came in, and um, that will show up on the tower site information. That's the relevance of the tower site information. It also may turn out that maybe during this time period you were targeted. And you were in an area, and this it enables us to go back and try and look for cameras and other things through the towers. I'm not saying it's going to happen in your case, but it's why we ask for tower sites, right? Tower sites always show when you're on the phone; they show you where you're where you are when you're on the phone making calls. Um, and that the above mentioned records are to be released for the York region to the York Regional Police for the purposes of an investigation of murder of your mum, and for the time period as stated, November 1st to November 9th. This is the part of the consent. I am voluntarily giving consent, and I know that I, you don't have to. You don't have to do this. This is your. This is you volunteering to do this. You may withdraw your consent at any time. I understand that these records may be used as evidence against, against me and may become any part of a criminal proceeding. Now, if you were lying on this, you know, as a part of this whole process that I explained, telling us fictitious information, it comes back. Now the records can also be used against you. If you're telling the truth, really, point three, it means nothing, okay? Um, but we have to let you know by law that we could use these against you if you're lying to us. And in consideration for Rogers uh, this, uh, Wireless, disclosing the records of the identified person above, I hereby release and discharge Rogers and its employees from any uh, liability whatsoever in regard to this closure. So this is what the phone companies have asked us to say that because we're giving you this thing, you can't use, you can't, the people who we got it from can't come and sue us. So it's a, it's a preamble, legal preamble. Um, and by doing this, by, okay, the owner subscriber, you're printing your name, you sign here, you print your name, your address, uh, your subscriber number and the date, and I sign with the witnesses to say that I witness this. And then, um, I'm going to ask you after this to try and contact that cousin to get us the name of the people who were with your mom tonight. Hmm, interesting. Is it? Then you, yeah, I think it is. Like I thought that they, if something had happened, they would have just done it anyway. But um, done what anyway? Like just gone through someone's phones. I thought you're they not allowed just, to. Hmm. You're not allowed. Okay. Um. Yeah, it just seems like well, I'm starting to think now. Do they know that maybe? But I don't want to say this. Has she got something to do with it? And she's They like don't know plans. anything at this point. They just want access to her records so yep. that they can see, like, so that they can link something. Mm. Like, they're, you know, they're like, maybe someone was following your mum or maybe someone was trying to target you or, you know, yeah. and they just need. But basically, like, any police investigation will, the f- one of the first things they do is get your phone records, but yep. they need permission mm-hmm. or they have to go to a judge and ask for a warrant for phone records. Yeah. Um, but she's volunteering. Like she's, yeah. So after the interview, Jennifer left and went to stay with her aunt and uncle. Her house was a crime scene and she wasn't allowed to go back and get any of her belongings. The day after the attack, as news spread amongst her family and the community, her phone blew up. She received text after text asking if she was okay. Even her ex-boyfriend Daniel sent Jennifer a message saying, if you need, I'm here for you. Just hang in there and try to eat. Rumors started to spread throughout the community. People were trying to make sense of what had happened in their quiet neighborhood. Were the pans caught up in illegal gambling or were there links to gangs and drug crime? The media coverage became widespread on this case and they would camp outside of the family home and the hospital where Han still remained in an induced coma. Wow. His family by his bedside hoping and praying that he would make it through. Jennifer was with them. While she was there, she asked her uncle if she could borrow some change to use the payphone as her phone had died. 
Her uncle offered up his cell phone for Jennifer to use, but she refused and instead insisted on using the payphone. He gave her two quarters and she headed down to the hall to use the phone. Jennifer called her ex-boyfriend Daniel Wong. Police began their investigation and initially were investigating what they thought was a home invasion gone bad, but it wasn't long before they realised that there were several inconsistencies in Jennifer's story. Oh, shit. Some of which were her recollection of the attackers, the sequence of events and the details of the crime did not align with the physical physical evidence or the statement of her father, Han Pan, who survived the attack. One of the crucial pieces of evidence was the absence of signs of forced entry into the Pan family home. Jennifer had initially claimed that the masked intruders had broken in, but there were no signs of forced entry, such as broken windows or doors. They also questioned how Jennifer, who was tied to the banister of the stairs, was able to grab her phone and make a 911 call. The position that she was in would have made it very difficult to reach, and this discrepancy raised suspicions. Video footage was able to be retrieved from a neighbor's home across the road, which showed the men fleeing from the scene in a vehicle. One particular day, while canvassing the neighborhood, police were approached by someone in the neighborhood. Oh my God, I've written neighborhood so many times. And they told them that Daniel Wong, Jennifer's ex-boyfriend, was a drug dealer. Hmm. Police wondered if this could be the connection that they were looking for. After all, a lot of home invasions like this are usually linked back to illegal activities like drugs. Mm -hmm. Two days after the attack, Jennifer was asked to return so that they could ask her some follow-up questions and hear Jennifer tell her sequence of events for that day again from the moment she woke up. She told the detective, Detective Slade, about her day and how her mother went to visit her grandfather. She went up and hopped on the computer to do some studying and play some games. He asked her if she remembered speaking to anyone that day on the phone or on Facebook and she tells him later on in the day that she spoke to her friend Andrew. He asked her to hang out and she told him that she wasn't allowed to leave the house or meet up with him and that they just had a general chat. This was the third time that Jennifer had been interviewed but this was the first time that she had mentioned talking with her friend Andrew. Mm -hmm. Jennifer then went on to tell the rest of her story and recalled the moment her father ran outside of the front door in the interview. Detective Cook, who was watching the interview in an adjacent room, found it interesting that a loving father like Han, who so obviously loved his children, would hear his daughter's cries and still choose to run out the front door, leaving her inside alone. Hmm. During the interview, they also asked her to recall how she was able to make the 911 call and if she could demonstrate this. Jennifer puts her arms behind her back as if she was tired and she pulls her phone from her waistband. She then pulls it up but she can only get her her arm as far as her hip bone and she tells police that it's this position that she was in and that she turned the volume up on her phone and yelled into it to hear the operator. Okay. At this point, the police are becoming increasingly suspicious of Jennifer's behavior. Throughout the interviews, she spends a lot of time with her head down and in her hands and often appears sniffly and as if she's crying, but there are never tears. Detective Slade then asked Jennifer if she had more than one phone. Jennifer said that she did have another phone, but she now only has one because she gave the other one back to Daniel. She does have a second SIM card that she uses sometimes and she tells the police that sometimes her phone gets taken away from her and so she would use the second phone that she, um, so that she could still call her friends, but she doesn't have it anymore. Jennifer mentioning that her phone gets taken away from her sometimes was not new information to detectives. After speaking with family, they knew a little bit more about Jennifer's past, but they needed her to tell her side of the story. Mm -hmm. Why would a 25-year-old woman not be allowed to see her own friends or still have her phone taken off her like she was a teenager? They asked Jennifer to explain what had been happening over the last few years. They asked her if she had a boyfriend, and Jennifer tells them that she did have a boyfriend, Daniel, but they were no longer together. She tells Detective Slade that they went to high school together and that Daniel helped her through a really difficult time. One time being when they were in Europe together and she had a bad bout of asthma and he took care of her. She tells them that they had been dating on and off for six years but that they had to keep their relationship a secret because she wasn't allowed to have a boyfriend. Jennifer explains that sometimes she used to skip class and go and see Daniel and this happened throughout grade 12 when she was in high school. Mm. 
Jennifer then goes on to tell Detective Slade that while her family thought Jennifer was going to school to study science, she in fact wasn't. She was lying and she never actually got into Ryland University. Due to her grades slipping in high school, they retracted their scholarship offer. But Jennifer was too afraid to tell her parents, so she lied and she pretended that she was going to uni. Instead, she was teaching piano and working at a pizza parlor as well as secretly seeing Daniel. Sometimes Jennifer's parents would even drive her to class and they would drop her off at uni and she would go and see Daniel and then come back and meet them at uni as if she had just finished class. Whoa, that's bad. So Jennifer kept up this facade for years Mm. and her parents never even knew that she was still seeing Daniel. That was until 2008, four years after she had finished high school. Bika, Jennifer's mother, drove to the mall and arrived earlier than usual and saw Jennifer getting dropped off by Daniel. Uh Jennifer's parents were furious and again demanded that she not see Daniel anymore. Mm -hmm. Daniel was brought into the station for questioning after the attack. Police asked him if there were there was any way that this that his drug dealing could be linked to the house invasion and that if he had any involvement, but he denied it. They then asked him to talk about his relationship with Jennifer and he shared all of the details and all of Jennifer's behaviors and lies that she had told over the six years of their relationship. Mm. Daniel told them that when the final ultimatum came from Jennifer's parents to end the relationship, he knew it was for the best. He knew that they had no long-term life together. He had never spent more than a few minutes with Han and Pika in all the time that they were together and they were never accepting of him. He said that Jennifer was a prisoner and the relationship had always been hard. So when it ended, he knew it was for the best. Their relationship became distant and he, and they rarely spoke after that. Sometimes she would call and sometimes he would answer, but eventually he stopped. Mm-hmm. Jennifer's lies about how she spent her days continued to spiral. Jennifer came up with fake acceptance letters into the pharmacy program at the University of Toronto, complete with a made-up scholarship for tuition. She continued to tell her parents that she was staying with her friend a couple of nights a week to lessen her travel time, and Jennifer's lies went beyond her family. She even kept up the facade to her friends. Her parents were so proud when she came home and told them that she was accepted into a volunteer program at the Toronto Hospital for sick children in a blood testing lab, but this was a lie. When it came time to graduate university, Daniel helped Jennifer hire someone online to fake a full college graduation transcript, complete with straight A's. (laughs) When her parents asked about the graduation ceremony, Jennifer told them that the class was so big that she was only allowed to invite one person and that she couldn't choose between them, so she she was going to invite a friend instead. Wow. Crazy. That is crazy. Right? In September 2009, just over a year before the home invasion, Jennifer's dad noticed that she didn't have a uniform for her hospital job, Mm -hmm. nor did she have any form of ID, which he knew that hospitals required. The following day, without saying anything to Jennifer, he insisted that he and Bika drive her to hospital where she volunteered. They dropped her off and Han parked the car. He asked Bika to follow Jennifer in to see where she went. Jennifer knew her mother was following her, so she went to the waiting room of the ER and hid for three hours until she was sure they were gone. (laughs) The next morning, Han called Jennifer's friend she had been staying with throughout the week, but her friend told Han that Jennifer hadn't been staying with her at all and Jennifer's web of lies unraveled. Oh, man. When Jennifer arrived home that day, her mother and father were waiting for her and they told Jennifer that they knew she had been lying and demanded that she tell them the truth. Jennifer, who had been carrying this burden of all of her lies, confessed. She told them that she had not been volunteering at the hospital, she had never been enrolled in the University of Toronto, and she had not studied pharmacology for the four years prior. It had all been a lie. She also confessed that she had been living three days a week with Daniel and his family, and that the story about her staying with her friend who lived closer to uni was a lie. Han and Pika ordered her to reapply for Toronto University and to pursue her degree. They knew she had her credits from Ryerson behind her and that she was going to be easily accepted. But Jennifer never went to Ryerson and although she had confessed to most of her lies, she wasn't willing to give up everything and so she didn't come clean about that. Han and Pika felt like they didn't know their own daughter. She was a stranger in their home and Han even tried to kick Jennifer out. That's why he ran the other way. 
To them, she was a disgrace, but her mother convinced Han to let Jennifer stay. She worried about what would happen to their daughter if they kicked her out. For two weeks, Jennifer was housebound. Bika stayed by her side the whole time. She wasn't allowed to go anywhere on her own. Her phone was taken away, she was forced to quit her jobs, and she was forced to repay her parents all the money that they'd given her while she while they thought she was at university. They eventually found out about high school and that Jennifer did not graduate year 12. That too had been a lie, and so they forced her to go back and complete the high school calculus. What? Well, she's like 25 at this stage. She's 24, yeah. Damn. So it's it's a lot. Like yeah, it's a lot. Like I understand that she lied. Like she's lied about her whole education. But basically, she lied because she's been scared. She yeah, hasn't had that. But she's also her- twenty four now. She's yeah. not fourteen. Let it fucking let her go and do her own thing now. Like it's yeah, a, it's a real. I feel it's a shit situation. Yeah, they they all are. Every yeah. story here is, but you know, as it come down, I feel it's not Jennifer's fault. It's the tiger parents. Like full on hardcore parenting. They're can very lead, strict. Can yeah. lead to that type of reaction. Yeah. So Jennifer was given a strict curfew of 9 p.m. and every aspect of her life was monitored. Eventually, Jennifer's mother allowed her to use her phone when Han wasn't home so that she could check her messages. Although Bika stood by her husband's side, she felt that. She felt for Jennifer. She understood that what they were asking of her was a lot and that she was an adult who should be able to make her own choices. Once Jennifer started to earn back her parents' trust, eventually Han allowed Jennifer to have restricted time with her phone and sometimes go places alone. But even with this small piece of freedom, they still checked her messages and would even go as far as to read the odometer on the car. Jennifer and Daniel would still sometimes sneak phone calls and still lying to her parents about seeing him. Kill me if I ever did that to my kids. (laughs) She was caught again and grounded completely. This is where Daniel basically says that, like, it's not going to work. Like, they're never going to let you date Mm. me like you're a prisoner. And that's when he calls it off. Yeah. He moves on and he gets a new girlfriend. Okay. There is so much more information and lies that Jennifer tells within these years and it's super fascinating and I really recommend like if you want to know more about how deep her lies go like that you go and watch her interrogation tapes because um, they're really insightful Mm -hmm. and there's also um, an episode on case files and it goes for like two hours like there's so much information There's, there's a lot that I haven't included but I've included as much as that relates to that night, Mm -hmm. I think. But if you want to know more, you can go and watch those. Are we going to get into like what happened soon? Yeah, I just wanted to put that out there because like I'm I'm skimming the surface of like how deep her lies go. Okay, Um, I'm trying to keep this not a two-hour episode or a (laughs) two-parter, so just clarify. So three days after the home invasion on November 12th, Jennifer's dad Han wakes up from his coma. After being shot in the face and arm and That's with hectic. bullet fragments still in his face, it, this was a miracle. Like it was yeah. miraculous that he woke up. But despite his serious injuries, he had a clear recollection of what had happened that fateful night. Mm-hmm. And it's not at all how Jennifer described it. Oh, shit. That's, yeah. Here we go. Tell me. Okay. Han tells detectives that he distinctively remembers Jennifer engaging in a friendly conversation with all of the intruders whilst they were inside the house. He also tells them that Jennifer was not tied up or restricted in any way. He revealed that she was observed moving freely around the house while the intruders were inside, making Jennifer the number one suspect in the case. Detectives brought Jennifer in for questioning again, and this interrogation would go on for nine hours, and eventually Jennifer would be caught in her web of lies and ultimately break down and confess her involvement. However, Jennifer's story surprised detectives. Jennifer told detectives that she had been struggling with depression and felt trapped by her parents and she wanted to end her life. So she hired people to break in and kill her. Jennifer said that if she killed herself, she would bring shame to her family. So this was the only way to end her suffering without hurting her parents, but that a misunderstanding occurred and wires got mixed and her parents became the targets instead. She told detectives that she tried to cancel but that the intruders wanted a 10k cancellation fee and when she couldn't provide it they showed up and she and killed her parents. Lies. 
After her confession, Jennifer was arrested, but something about her story still didn't make sense. Detectives weren't convinced that Jennifer was being truthful, and so they pushed her for more information again, and they tried to... Sorry, they try and comfort Jennifer by telling her she's a good person who just made a mistake and that they understand why she did what she did. But she now needs to tell the truth. It's yeah, time for her to do the right thing. Reverse psychology. You're all right. It's okay. You're not going to get in trouble. Okay. Nobody's going to come there and get the wrong people. Okay. They're not going to tie you up and just kill your parents. Okay. That's not going to happen. That's not realistic. Okay? That never happened. Okay? They were there because you planned this. They were there because you gave the order. Okay? And I understand why you gave the order. Because you couldn't do it yourself. Okay? That's good. Okay? Jen? Okay. But they were supposed to take your parents, Jen. And they did that part. Okay? Nobody needs... If you wanted to kill yourself, Jen, you're not going to pay somebody $2,000 to do it. I couldn't do it myself. Okay. But there's other ways. Okay? And if that was going to happen, they could have taken you outside and done it anywhere. It wouldn't matter, would it? Okay? There's no need to involve other people in this. If you really wanted to die, all they would have had to do is pull up beside you in a car and shoot you, right? They could tell me just to let him do it. Okay, but th- you're not going to accept that, okay? You're not going to accept that he's just going to randomly do it someday, okay? There's other things that happen in this case, Jen, okay? You let them in the house. You let them in. We know that. You went downstairs and you opened that door for them. We know that. Jen... You did leave the door open for them, didn't you? Pardon? Yes. Yes. And that's what... Naughty girl. So, Jennifer, with, you know, she comes clean. Mm -hmm. Like, it's done. And she tells Detective Slade everything. She says that three months before the attack, Jennifer got in contact with an old school friend, Andrew, Mm -hmm. the same Andrew she had spoken with the day of the attack and the evening of the attack. Jennifer and Andrew had gone to elementary school together and she had remembered him sharing stories about him robbing people at knife point. She told him about how awful her home life was and about how controlling her parents were. And Andrew told her that he understood and he admitted that even he had thought about killing his own father at one point. This planted a seed inside of Jennifer and she, by the early summer of 2010, she started to imagine a world without her father in it. Andrew introduced her to somebody by the name of Ricardo and together they come up with a plan to kill her father in the parking lot of his work. Jennifer had saved $1,500 from her piano lessons for the hit. According to Jennifer, Ricardo took the money and then stopped answering her calls. But Ricardo, when interviewed, told the police that Jennifer had phoned him in July and met her for coffee. She showed up and was upset and asked him to murder her parents and he told her no. He told detectives that she did give him money once, but it was only $200 and for a night out, which he eventually paid back. Andrew denied having any involvement with the hit. Jennifer then went to her ex-boyfriend, Daniel Wong, after Ricardo had supposedly disappeared. Mm -hmm. Jennifer knew that her parents had life insurance and that in the event of their death, she would inherit half a million dollars, which she could use to start a new life with Daniel. Daniel knew someone who could help Jennifer and he introduced her to Lanford Crawford. What a name. Lanford. Lanford Crawford. (laughs) Yeah. Daniel gave Jennifer a spare phone, which they used to talk to each other about the plan. This was the phone that Jennifer would swap her SIM card in and out of. Uh, Crawford was in charge of the plan for the hit on Jennifer's parents, and he recruited two other people to help him on the night. David (laughs) Milavigna... I can't... My... I can't say it. David M. I'm going to say that. David M. I really... I practiced this, and now I've forgotten how to Mm. pronounce it. Milavigna... Genem, I can't. David M. and mm-hmm. Eric Cardi. 
Crawford wanted $10,000 for the job and Jennifer agreed to pay him two grand on the night of the attack and the remaining once the life insurance money came in. Fuck. The date was set for November 2nd, but in the morning, Jennifer received a text from Daniel. He told her that he had a new girlfriend and with this information, Jennifer told Daniel to call off the hit with Crawford, to which Daniel responded, I thought you wanted this for you. She replied, I do, but I have nowhere to go. Daniel responded with, call it off with homeboy, which is Crawford. They Mm -hmm. also called him homeboy, question mark. You said you wanted this with or without me. And again, she replied, I want it for me. Then Jennifer received a text from Crawford asking for a time of completion. Jennifer responded and said today was a no-go as they had dinner plans. Eventually, a new date was set for November 8th. Crawford texted Jennifer and said after work, okay, will be game time. At 6.12pm, Crawford called Jennifer and confirmed it was on. At 9pm, Eric and David met up in a hire car and picked up Lenford. Lenford Crawford. Mm-hmm. At 9.35, David called Jennifer and let her know that they were close. At Gen- After Jennifer hung up, she went downstairs. She said goodnight to her mother. She went to the front door and unlocked it. At two minutes past 10, Jennifer walked to the study across from her parents' bedroom. She flicked the study light on and then switched it back off. This was caught on the security footage from the neighbor's house across the road. Mm. Two minutes later, David called again. They spoke for three and a half minutes. Within seconds of them hanging up, the rental car pulled up at the house. David, Eric and Lanford got out of the car and walked into the Pan family home. The evidence that the police had against Jennifer was strong. After Jennifer realized that she had been caught and there was no way she could lie her way out of this, she put her hands in her head, her head in her hands and she sobbed. She asked detective She asked the detectives, "What's going to happen to me?" You go to jail. Yeah. The day after Jennifer's arrest, police held a press conference and confirmed that Jennifer had been arrested for the murder of Bickhart Pan and the attempted murder of, of Han Pan. It would take detectives five months to gather enough evidence to also arrest Dylan Wong, Lanford Crawford, Eric Carty and David M. They relied on cell phone locations, calls and texts to piece it together the elaborate plan along with jennifer all of them were charged with first degree murder attempted murder and conspiracy to commit murder during this time eric cardi was arrested and sentenced for the murder of someone else and was already in jail when police were ready to make the arrests on december 13th 2014 jennifer pan david m daniel wong and lanford crawford were all found guilty of the murder of big pan and the attempted murder of han pan han pan Eric Cardi pleaded guilty before this as he didn't want to add to Han's suffering and was already in jail on a life sentence. Jennifer hung her head low and she sobbed. They were all sentenced to 25 years to life for Bikar's murder and life for Han's attempted murder to serve concurrently. The earliest Jennifer can apply for parole is in 2035. She will be 48 years old. Jennifer currently sits at the Grand Valley Institution Institution for Women in Kitchener, Ontario, and is now 37 years old. And that is the case of Jennifer Pan. Fuck hell. It's crazy. That was a wild one, wasn't it? What about, okay, well, what about the dad and the brother? So, Jennifer's, he survived, obviously, um, but they disowned her. Of course, yeah. They would have brought, she would have brought great dishonor to family. Yeah, so they don't speak to her, they don't Mm -hmm. speak of her, really. Felix doesn't really talk much about anything that happened. He, like, kind of represses it. Like, his mother was murdered by his sister. Like, that's that's a big deal. So, he kind of just carried on with his life and doesn't really talk about it. Like, his father is sad all the time Mm -hmm. like he misses his wife they were married for 30 years and his heart's broken without Bika and yeah he's well did he talk in any like the part like any of the interviews that you watched like afterwards no because he was in hospital during that time no not like like more more recent ones no Mm -hmm. he did issue uh like a victim impact statement Mm -hmm. it was quite long and that's kind of where he talked about how like his daughter basically like broke his heart and he's so sad without his wife and he's lonely and he doesn't listen to music anymore and he doesn't find joy in life and he he probably won't now because his wife's gone yeah, um sad yeah it's really sad oh man that's yeah this is hectic but it's like well, yeah, what did that 
where did that come from? You know, how did that all start? I mean, Is it the like I'm not parenting? justifying her actions. Like, oh, I, hell no. I, you know, yeah. she she was a capable adult. She could she have could have left. just, yeah, said, sorry, I love you, mom and dad, but I'm going, yeah. I'm, I'm getting out of here. Like I understand her, upbring- her upbringing was very strict and it would have been very hard and the pressure that she would have felt to you know be everything that her parents wanted to be after everything that they'd sacrificed like I can Mm. understand that that would be like so much pressure to carry but again like you in in what world would your life be better if your parents died versus you just leaving and I'm sure that the the um insurance money paid like a role or played a role in this scenario like she was also like I I didn't include it because I didn't want this to go for two hours but she was very obsessed with Daniel she yeah I wanted to be with Daniel like, yeah and so I feel like you know her getting rid of her parents was motivated by the thought of being able to be with mm-hmm. Daniel after and have this money to like set them up because she obviously didn't have any degree or any background and yeah you know Daniel also didn't have like a great path that he followed so mm. the money was very you know yeah but anyway still a shitty thing that she did yeah her hell mother yeah. is dead and her mother's last words were hurt us but don't hurt our daughter yeah and that's heartbreaking to me in that moment that she would know that her mother said that and yep. didn't do anything and i wonder what would have happened if the dad did die she probably would, would have got s- still away got with caught. It, you reckon maybe. she would have got away? Maybe more chance of getting away or not? Because mm. it was really when well, the dad came I mean, alive to say, yeah, her no, story that's... was very like obviously choppy. But I don't know if they had, without his statement, mm. I don't think that they had hard evidence to link yeah. her to the crimes. She might have gotten away with it just because they might have known she was guilty. But we know that you need evidence to, mm. you know, convict someone. So. His statement definitely like sealed the deal. Wow. But how heartbreaking for him. Yeah. During that. And how like so sad that like he could hear her calling out his name knowing what she had done. Yeah. And that's why he ran out the door. He didn't go to her. He just knew like, oh, she's going to try and finish. He was probably thinking she's going to try and finish me. I don't know what he would have been thinking. He'd been shot twice. His Mm. wife was killed. Like, oh my God. I just couldn't imagine. Not good. What he was thinking. So anyway, that was that was a crazy one with a little twisty ending. I mean, some of you might have seen that coming, but my, I guessed it. Did I guess it? No, you said it was Daniel oh, to I start. Said him, you said okay, it was Daniel. Yeah, yeah. So enough. anyway, yeah, along those lines, it was. Yeah. But that was a big one. I hope you guys enjoyed that one and you appreciate our efforts of getting this out quickly. <laughs> and I want five star reviews from all of you because <laughs> wow. my eyes are heavy right now. <laughs> um, I was losing it at the end there. My starter was back, mm. but we got through in the end. Yep. Anyway, hope you guys have a great week and we'll be back next week with another episode. If you have any suggestions, throw them at me and we'll chat to you guys next week. That's it from us. Tell me then. Oh, come on, what Phil. I say? What I say? No, Tell my... me next week. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Bye, darlings. Uh.